It is one of the strangest accounts in all of the New Testament. It is a time that has caused people to wonder, what exactly is Jesus doing here? Uh, Perhaps even to question his nature himself, because he's acting so peculiar. If you would, open to Mark chapter 11. In Mark chapter 11, last week we discussed being angry like Jesus, and we mentioned how he cursed the fig tree. So, I want us to pick up at this text in Mark chapter 11 and talk some about the setting for this fig tree. If you're there, it says there in verse 12, On the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. As you, as you think about this idea, what we want to talk tonight about is about this question. Why did Jesus curse this fig tree? As you think about the account there in Mark chapter 11, Jesus is walking, walking from Bethany to Jerusalem here in chapter 11. And it's only about two miles And he sees this fig tree there, and he's hungry. And he comes there, it's actually in leaf. As you think about what that phrase means, we... It's actually right about this same time of year, whenever this story happened. As you look at all the trees and all the plants, what are they doing? They're leafing out, just like that, uh, you know, I told y'all about the poison ivy I got. Didn't have any leaves. About two weeks later, there's leaves everywhere, right? That's how it happens. But uh, it was in leaf, and that's the same thing that was happening here. It's very similar to this time. And that's when plants are leafing out. Well, he comes up, and he wants to see if there's anything on it. He wants to see if there's some fruit on there, and nothing was there. Only leaves. Because, as the text specifically says, it was not the season for figs. Then Jesus curses it, and it dies. And we have that account a little bit later. You know, we have to ask the question, was Jesus doing this out of anger? Because it really seems out of character. I mean, the plant can't change itself, right? <laughs> I mean, what's the problem here? I mean, the plant, what did the plant do? The plant can't, it's not season for figs. Why is he angry at it? So there's some questions that we want to talk about. Was he unreasonably mad at the plant? That's a question that we have to ask. You know, the text says, as I said, that it wasn't the season for figs. So we got to ask the question again. Was Jesus expecting something from it? That's something we want to consider. And what we actually are going to learn is that Jesus had every right to expect something to be on that tree. And we're going to go through and discuss that as we go through. But as well, as you can imagine, some would use this text as a criticism of our Lord, saying that, well, he can't be the perfect son of God because he just flies off the handle like this and starts cursing plants. He's not the son of God because of this. No, there's a lot of things that people use and as we consider it, we're going to talk about it tonight. What, what is the answer? Why did Jesus curse that fig tree? Well, I'll tell you, I'm probably, I was probably like you are at this point. You're wondering, what is going on here in Mark chapter 11? Maybe I've never heard this story, or maybe I've heard of it, but I don't really know what the answer is. Well, at one point this last year, I ended up calling in to a friend of mine. I, I've referenced him before, Max Dawson. He has a radio program. And I asked him, I was wondering, okay, what's going on here in Mark chapter 11? And he told me the answer there on his radio program, and he referred me to a lesson that he presented on it. Well, what I'm doing tonight is I'm giving you the basis of that lesson. I'm going to give you what he was going through and explaining in that. But so it's based off that original material, but I will say this. The answer lies in the context and really in just knowing a little bit about fig trees. So, as you think about what you came to services tonight, you may not have thought that I was going to learn much from a fig tree, but I will tell you there is a lot to learn about just a simple lesson here about this fig tree. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So let's talk about this dramatic setting of the fig tree. As you think about any particular verse that you may have a question on that you don't really know the answer to, what do you have to start with? 
Got to start with its context. You got to know why that verse is where it is. The writers don't put things in there for no reason. They put them in a specific reason for a specific purpose for that for their overall message. So, if we miss the context, all we'll see is Jesus is just walking through. He's coming from Bethany to Jerusalem, and he got mad at a bush. That's how some people look at it. But there's a whole lot more going on. So, the first thing I want to examine with you is the time. The time specifically is about four days from his death. It is my understanding that this is Monday of Passover week. So as you're thinking Jesus is coming here in chapter 11, he has come for the Passover. You had the, the uh, triumphal entry. You remember they took off their coats. They cut the plants and they put all that down as they're coming in. They're praising him. And that's this same week where this is Monday, and that actual procession would have been there on Sunday. So that's, that's the timing here. It's er, Passover that year was in early April, and the day before, as I said, the whole, the whole section, uh, the day before all this with the fig tree was there on Sunday. And that's what happens here in Mark chapter 11. So it gives you a little bit of context, because this isn't the first Passover as we'll talk about a little bit later, this is actually probably the third or fourth Passover that Jesus has observed, but this is the one right before his death. So that gives you a little bit of context for that. But while we understand the time, we need to also understand the conflict that is going on in order to understand this particular, uh, this particular story. There's a clash that's coming between Jesus and the religious leaders in Jerusalem. They've been going at it for, for a long time now, having problems, disagreeing, having problems, and that, that type of thing. But this conflict, as I said, has been developing for over two years. You know, Jesus had been rebuking the, the leaders for all kinds of things. You can look back in Mark 7, as we talked about this morning. He's rebuking them for their hypocrisy, their their lack of, of true worship, those types of things. But go back over to Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 3, the Pharisees and Sadducees hated Jesus because of the things he was spoken, speaking about. He's talking about their religion. He's talking about their, their traditions and all these types of things. And here in Mark chapter 3, this is one of the verses we read last week as well when we were talking about Jesus being angry. And here in verse 1, He entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. They were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so, they, so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. And he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, Grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. But look at verse 6. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. That was probably over two years before that this particular situation had started to push them over to the edge. They wanted to destroy Jesus, and that's going on here behind the scenes here in this setting of the fig tree. So we've talked about the time, talked about the conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders, but we need to talk about this wicked plot. As I mentioned back here in Mark chapter 3, these leaders have been plotting specifically to destroy Jesus. That's what's mentioned there in verse 6. But this plan is coming to fruition. Turn over to Mark chapter, chapter 12 this time. I want to examine some of these verses after. Uh, our section in Mark 11, because as you can go through, that's we talked about Sunday, that's triumphal entry, that's there in chapter 11. Then we're on Monday, here's the whole story with the parable of the fig tree, and we know Jesus is going to be on the cross on Friday and raised again on Sunday. Well, during this time, you'll have different parables, different questions, and different things that are going on. Well, in Mark chapter 12, he told an especially stinging parable to these particular religious leaders. He talked about how you had the man that had the vineyard, and he had these stewards that were unjust, and he sent his servants there, and they would beat the servants, kill the servants, on and on. Then he says, hey, I'm going to send my son. And what do they do to the son? Y'all probably remember that story. They ended up killing the son, and then this, the, the landowner was going to be very angry. Well, look here in verse 12. 
After telling them this and telling them about the stone which the builders rejected, talking about Jesus, and they were seeking to seize him, verse 12, and yet they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Then verse 13, Then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. And then you know what happens? That's all those different questions. Like over there in Matthew I believe in 22, he had all these questions. What about the resurrection? What about uh, what's the great commandment, if I remember right? There's a whole series of questions. Well, chapter 12 goes through and lays those out. Then chapter 13 is when Jesus went through and talked about the destruction of Jerusalem. Then chapter 14, pick up with me this time in verse 10. Because even in that same context, in 12, he's rebuking the scribes for their hypocrisy. Uh, They have all these questions. He talks about the destruction of Jerusalem in 13, but then in 14, look here in verses 10 and 11. This is when their whole conspiracy is coming to a head. In verse 10, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money, and and he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. So this is what's going on behind this story. It's right around this time toward the end of Jesus' life, and there's this plot by the religious leaders to kill Jesus. Well, there's one other thing I want us to understand for this, is the lay of the text. Turn back over to Mark chapter 11. In Mark chapter 11, we read just a few verses there in 12 through 14 but you'll notice that Mark actually tells this story in two parts. So we're going to look and, and analyze that. But, you know, we ask the question, why would he do that? Well, we know here in verses 12 through 14, we read that. But read down with me in verse 20 now. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to them, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to him, Have faith in God. This middle section, in between these two sections, is one of the other things we talked about last Sunday night, where Jesus was angry and he cleansed the temple. But remember, that was the second time he cleansed the temple. This is about two or three years later, after what had happened in John chapter 2. So, as you look at all of this, that's what's provoking the Jewish leaders. Because look here in verse 15. Look at how they react to Jesus coming in. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a robber's den. Then the chief priests and scribes, again, this is the same group that he's been having problems with, heard this and began seeking how to destroy him. For they were afraid of him, for the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. That's what was sandwiched in between these two texts, where he goes through and cleanses this, and particularly they are very, very upset about what Jesus is doing, and they're wanting Jesus to be killed. So, As you think about what's going on with this whole text here, one of the reasons that God is going to judge the Jews is because of exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Two years later, they hadn't learned the lesson that he had tried to teach them back in John. They had not repented. And when you look at these people, you know, they're scribes, they're chief priests. They're surrounded all the time with spiritual things, right? The scribes are ones that take down the law. They're skilled in knowing the law. They're they're religious people. But one of the things that you'll notice is that they didn't have a heart for God. They didn't have the true spirituality. They didn't have it on the inside. You remember how Jesus addressed them over in Matthew 23? He called them scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. He talked about how they were whitewashed tombs, looked good on the surface, but didn't have it on the inside. That's what's going on here in this text right there in the middle. These were religious men. They spent all their time in in their days in the presence of God, but... The problem was they didn't have a heart for God. That's the kind of people that are are being talked about here in this. So 
as we look at the big picture of the book of Mark, we can consider the time. It's four days till the death of Jesus. There's this conflict going on between Jesus and the leaders. There's this plot, the conspiracy to kill Jesus, and then the lay of the text. You have this fig tree wrapped around the cleansing of the temple. This is the setting for what was going on here in Mark chapter 11. Now, for those who have their DVR, I need you to hit the pause button here for a second, and we've got to run over to our dictionaries or do some research on fig trees. So let's hit the pause button for a second and talk about this fig tree and the common fig tree. Well, the common fig tree actually bears two kinds of fruit. And as you think about this idea, the fig tree in Jewish culture is specifically a sign of prosperity. You know Isaiah 2, where he talks about uh, in Zion, he's going to establish a kingdom, those types of things. A mountain of the Lord is going to be established. There's actually a parallel to that in Micah chapter 4. He says almost the exact same thing. But there in Micah 4 and verse 4, he references how they are under their fig tree and they're underneath their grape tree. What that meant in fig trees in that time are a sign of prosperity, of, of, of a good thing. It's kind of, probably in Texas, it's kind of like if the oil derricks are moving, you know, up and down, what does that mean? That means there's money. There's money coming in. There's prosperity going on. Whenever they have a situation like that, that's how the fig tree is talked about whenever they have, uh, have that type of thing going on. So, in the days, in the last days, that's one of the things he mentions about sitting under their fig tree, relaxing, having that type of thing. Now, the answer to our text is not as difficult as it first appears. You know, if you go through and just did a simple Google search about fig trees and all that type of thing, you're going to get the information we're going to talk about. But let's first off talk about this first type of fruit. The first type of fruit is called the breba. As you'll notice here, it's a... Uh, I'll let you try to pronounce the other way of saying that, but that's what it's called. It's the breba is how we word it. But it is edible. It's something that you can eat, but it's an inferior thing. Um, it's actually one that in some cultures, they don't even, they don't even use it. It's just completely ignored. It's, uh, it's a bit harder. Uh, maybe it's only eaten by poor or by uh, those that are animals, that type of thing. As you'll notice, it grows only on the stem of last year's. Off of, off of the past. And then it's a tough fruit. It's kind of got a nutty taste is the idea. So it's, it's inferior. And uh, one thing, though, that's important, though, is this right here. This particular fruit appears with the leaves. That's the type of fruit that Jesus was looking at. It is not the season for figs. It's not a fig. It's something different. It's a different type of thing. It's called a breba. And this actually comes out in the time around March and April, again, about the time that we're talking about now, whenever it leaves out. So, as you look, it is like he mentions there in Mark chapter 11. It's not the season for figs, but this type of, of fruit was supposed to be on there. Now, let's talk about the fig here. As you have the fig, you'll notice it's on this new stem here. So, you got the main fig. It is juicy and sweet. Maybe you have some fig preserves. I was talking with my... Uh, my mother-in-law about this lesson. She she just loves fig preserves. Just really good, really tasty. Maybe putting them on some uh, some toast with jelly or uh, toast with bread or something. Toast with bread. Some toast with butter <laughs> is what I had in mind. So, but it's juicy and sweet. But you'll notice something. It grows on the new stem. So whenever it has some growth come out, that's where the fig's going to be on. That and it only grows on those. And then. It ripens later in summer. It can be uh, maybe as about six to eight weeks later it'll come in, and sometimes up to five months after the breba. So it's basically a forerunner for what's going to be coming in later. So that gives you a little bit of understanding with this. But the important thing you need to understand is not how to pronounce the, uh, the second name. There will be no figs. If there's no Breba, then the tree is fruitless. You all understand that? Everybody get that? So when Jesus is coming to this plant here, he is expecting to find the Breba. He is not expecting to find the figs, but he's looking for that first fruits or the, the, the basis of, the, of what would determine the fruit later. Now, it's my understanding that that's what he was looking for back over there in chapter 11 and in verse 13. As you'll look... 
It says, seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. It doesn't say he was looking for figs. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. If you went through and uh, you talk about the idea of him looking for figs, then yeah, the text doesn't make any sense at all, but Jesus was expecting to find those brevas. Now, as I mentioned, if it wasn't there, then the tree was fruitless. So, then let's ask the question then, kind of going back to what we've talked about. Why kill this tree? I mean, what's the problem here? (laughs) Well, the problem is, why do you have a fig tree? You have a fig tree in order to have figs, right? That's the point of having a fig tree. You don't have a fig tree just for a bush like, like some other things. It's got a specific purpose for it. It's supposed to bear fruit. So Jesus is destroying this fig tree, not, not only because it's not producing fruit, but because it's a sign of what's happening with Jerusalem, and particularly its religious, religious leaders. They had the look. They had the leaves, right? But they didn't have the fruit. There was a problem. There in their fruit. Now, turn over to Luke chapter 13. In Luke chapter 13, as you think about the idea of, of how this is pictured, of a tree that's supposed to be bearing fruit and it puts on the signs like it's going to, but it's not there, that is really depicting what's happening with the Jewish nation. It's a hypocrisy. It looks good on the surface, but it's not. It's, it's corrupted. It doesn't, it doesn't have its, its, its fruitfulness like it's supposed to have. Well, in Luke chapter 13, here in verses 6 through 9, this is another one that talks about the fig tree, and Luke doesn't record the same story as Mark, but he does talk about fig trees uh, here in this text. And he said in verse 6, And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which he planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it, and it did not find any. So you can imagine if you have a whole vineyard, right? If you went through your, your garden and you have a particular prepared group of ground, you've only got a certain amount of space there. And then you don't need plants that are just taking up space. I mean, if you've got a tomato plant that's not producing, get that tomato plant out of there and put in something different. Well, that's what the vineyard uh, keeper does here in verse 7. He said, And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, or I'm sorry, the master of the vineyard keeper. He says, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this tree, on this fig tree, without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. That's the same idea. But... Think about the context. Again, this is another con, another verse. You've got to look at the context. He's talking in this same idea about how Jerusalem needs to repent. You look at the timeline, three years or so, this kind of parallels what we're discussing over here in Mark chapter 11. But look here in verse 4. He says, Are you dis, or Do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's the idea. He told that parable to talk about the same type of idea that's described over there in Mark chapter 11. So, since the fig tree will be a sign of prosperity like we talked with Micah, and the fig tree is now barren and useless, it's taking up the ground, it should be cut down. That's the idea that's being pictured in both Mark and Luke. Now, that kind of gives you the answer here. And uh, actually, I forgot to do this. So let me give you a picture of these others. What you'll notice here, here's the fig tree with the breba. Perhaps you may not be able to see it real well, but you see the leaves coming on. And maybe you can see these little knotty things right here. There's little, little things on there. That's that breba. That's what he was expecting to find. But... Over here, that's a fig tree. And you'll notice some of the big things here. Those are the good figs. You see the difference there? That's the, uh, the, uh, the idea that we're talking about. Now, let's discuss this then. Let's talk about some lessons from this cursed fig tree and kind of go back to what we were talking about. Well, as you think about this in Mark chapter 11, 
obviously there's a lesson for the apostles, right? It's the miraculous faith that Jesus shows here, yeah, that's a, a powerful thing. It shows the power that can be done with that miraculous faith. But there's obviously more significant things going on here. You could also talk about, as we've discussed, there's a point for the Jewish leaders, for the Jews, that corrupt religion, that fruitlessness, it was going to bring judgment on them. That's what was going to happen and what ultimately did happen. But what I want us to talk about for a little bit is about for those who profess to follow Jesus because there's a lot of lessons we can gain from this text. So as you think about this, one thing you'll notice first off is this, is that the Lord expects each one of us to bear fruit. As you go through and think about the, the fig tree and about that, that idea, he's expecting us to be like that fig tree that's giving the signs, that is doing the fruit bearing. And if we're not, there's a problem. As you think about that, turn over to John chapter 15. In John chapter 15. There's a lot of different references to, to bearing fruit and those types of ideas. But in John chapter 15... Let's pick up here in verse 1. He said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch, and dries up, and they gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As Jesus is there talking to his apostles, again, right before his death, just a couple of days after this same story about the fig tree, he's telling them bearing fruit's a priority. You've got to have a change in life, a difference of what was happening. Now, you know, the point is we're made to bear fruit. (laughs) It's not an option. It's not something that we can say, well, okay, there's a few people that can bear fruit and then we'll have all these other people that don't bear fruit. That's not how it works. As a Christian, we're supposed to be doing that. So one other lesson we also learn is that appearance and outward show is not enough. There has to be a change in our life. There has to be a change in the fruit. Do you think about what Jesus is discussing there? He's coming and the, the plant looks good. On the surface, it looks good, but it wasn't all the way through. It wasn't bearing fruit like it needed to. Turn over to Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5. And I want us to pick up here in verse 22 as we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And what he's laying out here is you have the Spirit working in people's lives, and it is acting in your life and in my life. And what he's saying is, here's the fruit that's going to come out of that if that process is actually happening. And he says here in verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. As you think about the idea here, our relationship with Jesus isn't just some mental acknowledgement of the fact that he, is, that he is God. It is a life-changing experience, that He is my Lord and He changes the way I operate and the way that I act. It is supposed to be a life-changing and a fruit-bearing type of experience that shows up in our life. But people who belong to Christ... They're bearing this kind of fruit. They're seeing these type of things in their life. They're seeing the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, all of these types of things. And whenever we go through and we have, uh, you know, the works of the flesh and those types of things that Keith talked about this morning, there's a problem there. There's a disconnect in what's going on in our responsibility. 
But I will say this, fruit bearing is all over the New Testament. We've talked about it a little bit in the past. In Matthew 7, it was one thing that was expected. You would identify false teachers by it. In Mark chapter 4, there in the parable of the sower, you remember that they were bearing fruit, and there was that same idea. But the question we need to ask is, are we bearing fruit to God? You know, I, I can see it. I can see it already that it is happening because I know you and you know me, our relationship here. Where are you right now? You could be at home. You could be somewhere else. But where are you? You're here, aren't you? <laughs> you have love and you have the joy and the peace and all these things in your life. What is that? That's a sign of the fruit, right? Now we want to keep on excelling still more, right? But those are signs that we are trying to bear that fruit. So as you think about this, we also want to consider this lesson is that the Lord pulls back the leaf <laughs> and looks for fruit. That's going to be the truth, and that is the truth. You know, the, fig, the lesson of the fig tree isn't a lesson about trees. You know, there's a whole lot better people that can tell you about, about how to grow a garden and all that kind of thing. You can talk to Jack Holmes about how to grow a garden, right? But the lesson was about the fruitless Jewish nation and how God destroyed them. And it was all because it was an outward sign of righteousness. It was an outward appearance of righteousness. But again, the people didn't have that heart for God. So the lesson for us is we've got to have more than appearance. We've got to actually be bearing the fruits. It's got to be showing up in our lives. You know, anyone can look good on Sunday morning, and we can look good while we're here. But that alone is not the final test. The final test is Jesus is going to do like in, Luke, in John chapter 15. He's going to pull back that leaf on our lives and see, are we bearing that type of fruit and glorifying with that? So that's the lesson this evening. I hope that you've gained something out of that. I know that, uh, you know, we strive to excel in this, try to improve in this. And uh, as he talks about in John 15, you know, he prunes those things back so we can bear more fruit. So we want to keep on increasing in that. So I thank you for your attention. And hopefully you've learned a little bit about fig trees this evening. So we definitely want to extend the invitation to anyone that has not obeyed the gospel. If you haven't uh, understood and know our God, our God is loving and patient and kind. He's willing to forgive. He just wants us to change, to repent, to stop living the way of the world and to come back to him and be restored back to him and to, as we talked about tonight, to bear fruit. That's the lesson for us tonight. If you are not a Christian and want to respond to obe in obedience to the gospel, the water is ready. If you're a Christian and you want to change your life to do better, who doesn't want to do that? But if we can help you at all, uh, come forward as we stand and sing.